This conference will now be recorded. Okay, uh, call to order. It's uh, 7.02, September 15th, the public safety meeting, call to order. So um, looking for approval of the minutes. Laura, can motion, motion to approve? Thank you, Laura. Second by Jim Duffy. Okay, and um, we'll start with the department reports. We'll start with uh, EMS. Hi, good evening. Um, uh, I, did, did you guys get my report? Yes. Okay. So um, call volume, uh, I, I wanted to show you what the call volume looked like through uh, COVID. Um, you can see that uh, basically between February and, and June, call volume was down slightly. Um, it's back up to normal at this point. Um, we are fully staffed. We have no COVID exposures at this point. Uh, volunteers have done about 10,000 hours thus far. That's significantly lower than normal, but it's primarily because um, a, a lot of the volunteers have opted to not come in and volunteer due to COVID. Um, and then uh, we are still practicing um, all the COVID procedures and wearing masks on duty. Um, as far as training is concerned, we have restarted uh, some limited uh, training offerings. Um, you know, we've just cut the classes in half and we've got all kinds of COVID precautions in place uh, during each class. Um, we are planning on ramping that, you know, ramping the frequency of classes up, but keeping the class sizes the same until uh until we get to a little bit of a better place that's all i have all right any questions for the ems um no, paul Tavares. go ahead, go ahead paul oh. uh, go ahead, thank paul, you mr sorry. chairman it, mike uh, has the um slowdown of volunteers has that impacted manpower uh yeah I mean, you know, to a certain degree, yes, because obviously to maintain manpower, I've got to replace some of that with paid staff. Um, but, uh, but we're, you know, we're making do. I mean, we still do have a decent number of, of volunteers that are still coming in and doing their thing. It's just that uh, it has gotten a little bit more difficult with many of them saying, you know, we're, we want to stay safe. So. Thank you. Excuse me, I just, Mr. Chairman, just a question also for him. What is the normal number of hours you would have normally seen at this point of the year uh, pre-COVID? So we do about 25,000 a year. Um, and, uh, you know, we've only got, what, three months left to the, well, to the calendar year, right? Um, and so, um, you know, they're not going to be able to make up, you know, 15,000 more hours in three months. So um, I'd say we're down, you know, significantly based on that. But at this point, we've probably seen 18 normally. Okay, so close to half. He has a rough number. Yep. All right, perfect. Any more uh, questions for Mike? Let's uh, move over to the dispatch report. I don't know if uh, if JP is on. Um, if not, I can just, this is probably going to be one of the last times that I do this. Uh, JP will be taking it on from here. But um, uh, there's they're fully staffed. Um, there's no COVID issues. Uh, everybody is, uh, we, they are still um, uh, screening calls for COVID. Um, and uh, no other major issues going on at this point in the dispatch center. All right, good. Any questions for him for on the dispatch? All right. <coughs> I, I got a copy of the police report in the email. Hope everybody else did. Um, 
So any questions for the police department or a summary from the chief? Yeah, so as uh, if, you, if it's stats are, are we're showing about a 12% decline in uh, crime from uh, last year in August. We did have a rise in stolen vehicles in July. Um, we had probably, I, was, I think it was 25 and we're down to 16 last month. So 25 in July. We did make a lot of rest in that area. Uh, it was like eight, so the majority juveniles, some adults. Uh, it's still an issue with people leaving keys in the cars and such. Um, it, it's just going to, we're not the only ones affected by this. It's really the whole area. It's something we just got to keep on top of and just keep trying to you know, get people to lock up their cars and don't leave the keys in there. Um, we did add uh, another recruit to the academy started on Monday and that's Ariel Leon Jr. Um, we also, just to let you know the, the issues we have with recruiting, we went through, we had 10 candidates that we did uh, backgrounds on and we came down up to only one. So, I mean, it's getting pretty tough. And, uh, you know, we are facing the same issues with a lot of uh, other communities. It's hard to get, you know, people interested in law enforcement. There's just a lot of uh, scrutiny, pressure. And I think a lot of people decide it's just not worth it. So, but right now we're holding our own. We're, we, you know, our manpower is okay. Um, we had, you know, a pretty good summer overall. Um, if you looked at some of the things we had with the New Yorkers coming in and flooding our beaches and, and things like that. But I, I think we had a, a fairly um, decent response. We were able to secure a $35,000 grant. <clears throat> so we put extra patrols to deal with that. So it didn't cost uh, the town of Stratford any money. So I mean, we were, you know, kind of tamp that down in the course after Labor Day, everything kind of quieted down a bit. So, and that's about it. Thanks, Chief. Uh, any questions for the Chief? I just have a couple of, of um, little things. Um, I I know that we have litter laws and stuff, is, and I know that it's probably really super hard to enforce those. Um, it, it's just... You know, like the pictures on Facebook of the Walmart area and, and all that. How, how does that get policed? Like, can you arrest somebody for littering? If you, or do you have to see it to get reported? I mean, that's, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, we, uh, we have an issue with the um, Moffitt uh, up a honey spot. It's a constant dump area, and we're always struggling. You know, we've made some arrests there. I just wish we could be at the right time, you know, but, you know, it's just so hard to, you know, I've, I've been behind people, literally, who reach out the windows to dump their garbage and we'll stop them. It, you do. It's really, I wish I had enough officers to get them all the time. It does, you know, take away from the beauty of the town. It is an issue. Uh, but, you know, the private property is Walmart responsibility, and, and they're usually pretty good about cleaning it up. But, you know, we, we see with the mask and the gloves and everything else, it seems to be a little more than usual. But it's a constant struggle, to be honest. And, but we just got to keep on top of it. Uh, and, you know, we're going to start using more of the technology and the cameras and things like that to see if we can really start solving these issues. My other question was about our local beaches and the parks, including Roosevelt Forest, the new dog park over there. Um, do you see any need for, like, an additional park patrol? kind of person or is there somebody on staff that you know would would be able to do that check cars at these places make sure that they are residents i don't think that roosevelt forest has any sort of a gate or a checkpoint like beaches um and it's it's quite popular now with the dog park and a lot of people are leaving their trash and their dog remains there so um I don't know if you have any complaints about that or if there's something, is this something that the police would be charged with? Um, not, not in actually securing, uh, not having manning it per se, but patrolling it, yes. Um, mm -hmm. If you do want to hire someone to run it, I will volunteer for that. I will gladly leave the chief of police position and, and volunteer to take it. It sounds it's been like a long week. <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> so, but uh, we are looking into a camera system for up there. Uh, okay. I did get three quotes, so we're going to look to put some cameras up there that assist us. So uh, we do have uh, drive-throughs and riding checks. Of course, it's always you got to be there and see something. But if we have a camera system, we can go back and see what happened. So that's our plan. I'm just trying to secure the funding for it. I think I have identified it, so I'm working on that now. 
Okay. And then my last question um, is just your opinion about the golf cart um, proposal for the Lordship area. Well, I'm a golfer, and I think they, I prefer to see them on the uh, golf course, but... No, I'm completely, I'm completely neutral on it. I, I, I'm, I leave it to the council to decide how you want to uh, deal with that. I think uh -huh. I had a, some very brief conversations. What I thought should be maybe a uh, temporary um, allowance of it, but with a, a fine structure. You need an ordinance in place. You need a very severe fine. It can't be people under 21. It can't be after dusk. And if you are caught, that $500 fine. But don't forget, it's not just lordship. It's going to be all of Stratford, which is fair. I mean, you're going to open it up to everywhere. And if you're willing to allow that or willing to accept that, I mean, I, I'll leave it on you. I'm I'm neutral. But just make sure we have the tools to enforce it in a penalty that's pretty severe if you violate it. It just, like, in my opinion, it's um, a lot of our police resources are going to be spent in the Lordship area monitoring not only the parking laws that are down there and now the golf cart concern down there so I, I was just wondering if you had an opinion about it so that's it it's, it's i'm really neutral and i i mean I, I can't speak against it um i'm just i'm really what what do you as a council want to do with it but i also think i'm not going to ex exhaust my resources and lordship everybody deserves the same amount of policing and safety and security and that's my priority so you know if we're seeing something and they're in violation well they're going to suffer a fine i i appreciate your response then that's great Thank you. Uh, Paul Tavares, District 3, from the chair. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. How you doing, Chief? Great, Paul. Thank you. I have a, I have a, one question and one concern. Uh, my first question is, the question is, where have you been casting your net for uh, possible uh, recruits? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, we, we, uh, actually been, we've been to Housatonic Community College. We just made uh, uh, been talking to the NAACP Reverend Lord, and he's uh, we made some inroads to actually he's going to advertise some of that to increase our minority recruitment. So we're we're just going to start pushing forward to to really I really exhausted our list for Stratford residents, but now I want us to really push to go outward into the community colleges and local areas. I do want to do a recruitment drive. But I want to focus on minority hi hiring. That's really important right now. We're at about 28 percent, which is very good. But I'd like to see us upwards of 30, 35 percent. I think that would be excellent. And I think we just got we're making those connections so we can get with our partners, assist us and help us recruit. That's the best way to go right now. I've been in touch with uh, Reverend Lord also. Hey, Chief, if you need some help, you know, um, I'm retired, but I'm still active. So I will have I've, someone in touch with you. Abs absolutely. Uh, and and my, my, absolutely. And my concern is that, you know, we're still having a lot of speeding on South Ave. I, I know that you're, uh, you know, you, you're having staffing situations, but it's, uh, these people are going up and down the street with impunity. I mean, if we just had a, a few units to kind of get the word out that, you know, you can't use South Ave as a racetrack, I, I, I'm just really concerned. I mean, they really rip and run through here. So I, I just want to make you aware, and if there's somehow, um, you know, that, that, that we can at least get some, uh, um, something resolved there that'd be appreciated absolutely Can you if you could just, is it any just give me like a is it all the time is it more in the morning the evening if you just kind of narrow it down for me and i can well, i'll have units out there it, it's definitely uh cyclical in the morning you know people that are for whatever reason are rushing to work uh in the evening and in the in the dusk hours i mean i got the windows open and you know i can just hear them ripping so Pretty much in the morning, more, uh, rush hour, uh, and uh, in the evening, and especially in the early evening. Yes. I'll take care. Got it. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments for the chief? Mr. Chairman, I have a question as well. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, chief, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, assisting the other night and at least getting, uh, getting the officers out here for the party up on North Peters. Um, my question, though, comes a little bit more on your policy with regards to shutting down parties that large, especially that are greater than 100 people. I know when I had spoken with you, uh, I said it was in excess of 100. Um, when I saw everyone leave, it looked as if there was probably closer to two to 300 people at the party. Um, everyone in the neighborhood was very angry. 
uh, considering the fact that it was a, it wasn't really a an anniversary party as you may have been told. There was a professional DJ there. They had bouncers, uh, an organized party that uh, was set at this house. Uh, we couldn't get cars up and down the street easily. Even your officers had trouble getting up and down the street. Um, what can be done with regards to this? The officers obviously um, they didn't, you know, cite this party and tell them they had to bring their attendants down. But how are we handling this? Because we don't want to end up having more issues like this come up and then, you know, end up on the news as being someplace that started as ground zero for an infection again. Um, and secondly, if we do get something of this size in a neighborhood like this, when does it cross the line from just being a regular party to be kind of becoming kind of a like a public safety hazard and that it can't be held there because, you know, it's causing such a hazard for the neighborhood in and of itself? Well, there seems to be a discrepancy of fact because the officers there and the supervisors are saying there was not 200, 300. Um, they went in backyard, everybody was social distancing and masked. Um, so I, I, I don't know where you're getting your information. I can only tell you what the officers on the scene saw. I talked to them that night and that's what they told me. If it's over and excessive and in violation, they will we'll shut down the party. They're also, now that we have the executive order, they'll get infractions if they're not following the proper procedures of having a party. I mean, you're, I understand that we had that communication. It's contrary to what you're telling me right now. So I don't know where to, if you want us to come in, we could discuss it. I'll bring the officers in. We'll sit there and we can just compare facts. Well, I know when the officers, and, and, and I'm not, you know, trying to start that with it, but I know when the officers were there, they did get cars to move. After they left, then we had even more people show up. And I think when they came at the, at the end of the evening to try and shut the party down, I think they probably also did see how many people were there between there and parked in Shelton to come in here. And that's where I think we had our biggest part of the problem was all the people trying to get in. And it became a big safety issue. Um, and I just don't know where we also crossed the line and saying, okay, it's not safe to have this here. You know, what what can be done and where, where does it go from just being, you know, a party that anybody can have to being also a big safety issue? We shut it down, period. If there's an issue, it's a safety hazard and it's affecting the neighborhood, we shut it down, period. Okay. That's it. Okay. I had a lot of people ask me about it in the neighborhood as well, so I wanted to at least address it so I could give them some information from you as well. Okay. And the, the officers are there, they're on scene, and every time you'll call, we'll come. All right. uh, any other questions for the chief for the PD? Okay, uh, the fire department. Hey, hey, Bill, Larry, we're here at the, uh, we get a lot of static here. I'm here with the uh, Chief Hofstetter right now. Can you hear us? Okay. Well, I was just looking right. to, we're, we're on the fire department report. If there's questions for the fire department, they could recap their report there. That's all. Can you hear me? Yep, there you go. Okay. Um, you. Okay, just a summation. Uh, in the fire suppression side, uh, the department went on 562 uh, calls. Uh, we had three structure fires, two of which were uh, minor. One was substantial. That was on Columbus Avenue. Uh, it was very fortuitous that uh, one of our attack uh, five happened to be on Columbus Avenue for a medical call and came across the, uh, the fire. And uh, the actions of the firefighters on the, the PAC-5, uh, only three of them, but they acted aggressively and were able to uh, uh, basically control the fire until the rest of the troops got there. Otherwise, the situation would have been much worse. The house was significantly, significantly damaged. Uh, it was a duplex, but uh, their actions at least saved the other side. Um, as far as training, uh, this month we've done driver training, the monthly medical training, uh, monthly supervisor and chief officer training, uh, scene size up, technical skills reviews of search and rescue, uh, CPR refreshment, sexual harassment training, and fit testing. Uh, we've got a new uh, 
sort of medical mask and all the members are being fit tested so that they're, uh, they wear the proper size. Uh, fire station renovation, the Huntington Road Fire Station uh, has been the living quarters. Uh, that's been completed and it's a, a vast improvement to what it was. The Lordship Station is undergoing uh, installation of a new HVAC system as well as some painting and modifications in the living quarters. Uh, this work is near completion. In the Fire Prevention Bureau, uh, one additional deputy fire marshal was added to the bureau. There is now the fire marshal and three deputies. Uh, the bureau conducted 176 inspections, did six plan reviews, and signed 24 permits. Uh, the fire marshal continued to inspect the work being done uh, on the New Stratford High School and did a final walkthrough prior to the school opening. Uh, the fire marshal's office also walked through all the elementary, middle, and high schools to ensure modifications that were made to the schools for the uh, opening of the school year. Uh, the modifications were made for the COVID, uh, that everything was up to code. Uh, that is what we do. Speaking of COVID, we did have, uh, we do have one firefighter who tested positive. Uh, we're doing everything we can to uh, ensure that nobody else comes down with it, uh, and well, so far, so good. So that's all I have. I uh, wish him for a speedy recovery. Uh, any questions for the fire chief or comments? Um, yeah, uh, Paul Tavares, uh, District 3. Uh, that uh, fire on Columbus Avenue, yeah, uh, you guys did a great job because uh, I was pulling into my driveway and I saw the smoke and just followed it. And, uh, you know, uh, we're taking care of the family there. But uh, yeah, you oh, guys, did a, guys did a really good job. So kudos to the guys. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Laura Dancho, District 10. I have a, a quick question um, that I'm hoping you can help me with. Um, this is regarding the address 577 Holly Lane, which is Jim Fitzpatrick's property on Holly Lane that um, has a, a house on it. And, um, a lot of debris it's like he's trying to construct a, a restaurant there um but he's he's claiming that the fire department used the existing old building for training and um which is fine but the building seems to be pretty derelict and i'm just concerned that it's a neighborhood safety hazard and I, I just wanted to know if you knew anything about that or if you have an opinion about whether you think the fire department is going to continue to use it or is still using it for training or if it should be demolished if he's not going to construct this restaurant in the very near future. Uh, I'm sorry to say I know nothing about this. Um, you know, I don't recall. I mean, of course, I'm. Uh, mm -hmm. if you may be familiar with my situation, I just came back here in April. Uh, kind of filling in as a deputy, and uh, I don't know, since I've been here, I don't know of us going there for training. Uh, I'm somewhat familiar about the property you're talking about, but mm -hmm. other than that, I, I don't know anything. I can look into it for you and get back to you. I, I would appreciate that if you maybe want to talk to um, Chief Lampard about it. Maybe he uh, has some background on it. I'm just concerned because the building clearly seems like it was used for training, there's holes in the roof. It's probably full of um, critters now, and I don't even understand how it's standing on its own. So if, um, mm -hmm. if that's something that should be demolished, um, we'd be interested in, in having that done or um, we're talking with Jim Fitzpatrick about making sure he's gonna get that. He keeps saying that the fire department's using it. So that's my question to you. Are you still using it? Hey, hey Laura Clary. So yeah. our, uh, our, our methodology for that is we do seek out uh, properties for training. Sometimes it's just a fire department. Other times it's a joint training operations. Mm -hmm. But it's always under the guise like, that the property will eventually be a knockdown. Right. Um, we never use a property that could be resold or in good enough shape for that. It's always identified as a knockdown. So it's hard to find properties. But when you do, you want to try to use it as much as you can. To add to the realism of the training, but I don't, mm -hmm. I, you know, um, I don't know the last time this was done. Um, I'm sure Chief Hostar can get that info tomorrow. So. Okay, yeah, I I just like to follow up on that because um, it seems like it's 
it's um, I, I understand that he's supposed to be constructing a restaurant. He will eventually put a restaurant there, but I don't know how soon that's going to happen. And I'm wondering if the condition of the building is uh, a safety hazard and possibly even a health hazard if there's something living in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask. Uh, I'll touch base with our training officer tomorrow and see if you know when the last time we used that. If in fact we did. Okay, um, that'd be great. And then we can get back with the developer, with the owner, and, and see what he can do about that blighted spot. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Chief, Jim yeah, Duffy, a uh, question yeah. for you. I looked at the report, and one of the things I didn't see on there was the number of uh, medical responses that you guys are going to monthly. My question is, I understand that during the beginning of all the coronavirus uh, infection in the area, the responses were adjusted to uh, basically mitigate exposure to as many people as possible. So there were fewer fire responses to medical calls. I understand that uh, things have more or less gone back to, uh, in the area at least, normal response with the exception of a confirmed corona case on a uh, through the dispatch center. My question is, have you guys started, gone back to normal response on most calls? And if so, have your numbers come back up at all yet? uh funny you ask that we were prepared to go back uh monday but because of uh a us having one of our persons contract the virus and also that the slight uptick in the virus cases we uh, put it off for a week and we're going to reevaluate we are looking to go back uh it's like a tier, if you will. Um, there was a block of certain calls that we backed off on, and we were looking to go back up that one tier. Uh, again, that was supposed to happen Monday. We backed off of that because of the situation, but we're going to readdress it uh, next week. Uh, I guess as a corollary to that, uh, the one case that you have in the department, was there any contact tracing done to find out if it was work related or if it was from off the job as far as we there was one concern uh that uh, the person involved uh, went out with the crew on an engine company that it was a possible uh COVID case it turns out that that was not the case the the person you know the uh, patient was not COVID and it, what we've been able to ascertain is that our guy caught it off site he caught it uh you know, not on the job. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other questions for the fire chief? All right, Larry, the uh, emergency Bill, management. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Greg, go ahead. Can. Greg, Greg, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see. Um, uh, the deputy chief mentioned. Uh, staffing in the fire prevention office and did we have a backlog of what I'll call required inspections and will that change in staffing that he referred to you know help us alleviate it if it did exist uh, yes we did and yes it will uh, it was the, the we had been staffed at four people in that office uh, previously. We put a new person in in January we had to, through, uh, to, to bring it up to full staff up to four. And then uh, Brian Lampard, who was the fire marshal, then moved over to become the chief. So therefore, there was another vacancy. And that vacancy was filled. So we're at four. It, there was a backlog uh, prior to the COVID pandemic. And with that, we fell behind because we didn't, we weren't going into three family homes and public places and so forth. So we're playing catch up now. And uh, certainly the fourth man is uh, very productive. Okay, thank you, it's good news. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right, uh, emergency management and public safety, Larry. 
Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. So I'll start with the public safety side first. So just to provide some detail on our staffing change. So um, Jay Pietrzynski now is the superintendent of dispatch. Um, he's not the director of dispatch because of um, union rules and requirements do not allow that title to be utilized at that level. So JP still in the union, but now he has responsibility uh, for dispatch. And then obviously dispatch reports to me and so forth. Michael Louise now is concentrating on the EMS uh, department, which he's director of. And he's, we've added something else that we are going uh, both uh, feet deep in the water to maximize our training room potential including our training room at EMS, as well as the lecture facility room at the new community center of Stratford High. Um, we've, uh, we've, Mike and I, well, Mike did all the work. We uh, created a, a, a business plan with some uh, potential uh, budget and revenue numbers. Um, I think it's a good way to maximize education locally as well as the region, and also bring a few extra dollars into the um, into the town. So the uh, time that Mike was working with dispatch, now he's going to focus that additional time, if he has any, but he will, um, uh, to uh, develop the training. And the training is going to uh, predominantly, at least at the outset, to be EMS based, but we're looking to do training for all the branches of public safety, um, as well as um, some other ancillary training as well. Um, and again, how you know as the marketplace goes and as the uh, the need arises, we 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 can adjust that. So that's from uh, that's a JP and uh, Mike uh, situation. Um, on the um, uh, public safety side as well, uh, the BOE uh, we sp we spent a lot of time um, uh, reconfiguring the PPE um, at the last minute. Uh, preschool kids were uh, told they were going to wear masks so we had to adjust and put orders in for preschool as uh, chief hostetter mentioned the fire marshals went through the schools for um uh fire marshal type of activities i went through uh, with the health department through all the schools looking at the uh, covid requirements including uh safety panels including um distance for uh, seating um, and including um, uh, correct um, uh, uh, class configurations. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we had a first week kicked off, so it seemed to be okay right now. Um, on the emergency management side, uh, the storm Isaiah we just had, I submitted a um, initial damage assessment to uh, Region 1 and Homeland Security and FEMA. Uh, the primary damage assessment, which includes our costs as a town incurred, um, um, has to be submitted by October 3rd. We just had a call, a regional call today, so I'll begin working on that. So all the additional costs for staffing, for um, uh, uh, public safety, for um, uh, dispatch, for um, public works, for um, bringing in uh, subcontracted uh, crews for um, uh, bush and, and tree cut down and, and moving and clearing, uh, that all stuff will be uh, factored into that and will be submitted by early uh, October. So those are the big highlighted items. Any questions? Yeah, any questions for Larry? Uh, uh, Greg Cam? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just a, a maybe, Larry, uh, coordination with the Board of Ed security officers and the police, um, the police officers that are in the school system. Uh, how's that working in conjunction with the uh, police department and even, the, say, the fire marshal? Well, we all work together. It's a team event. Um, and uh, the, uh, the court, everyone's brought on board with all the information, even though some of it may not be specifically relevant to their tasks, but just so everyone's on the same page. And there's some overlap. Uh, part of my job is, is to 
see where the overlap is happening and if there's any holes in it uh, that we need to fix. But, you know, anything uh, revolving around those departments, I coordinate with the individual chiefs uh, first because we like to, you know, follow a chain of command. And um, uh, it seems, you know, seems to work all right. Uh, the problem isn't the public safety. The, the problem moving forward would be the additional security staffs in the school that over time I have to develop uh, more of a cohesive uh, training program so they're all on the same page. Right now they're being operated as um, each school with their own little operating node and uh, we want to get everybody on the same page, but it's going to take some time. But the SROs and, and the, and the uh, police in there and, and the fire marshal, there's a tremendous amount of coordination. Um, some would even say that I get along with Chief McNeil, but that's just a rumor. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, rumors have reasons. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's, so the the standardization of training uh, in in security protocols for the Board of Ed buildings is is being coordinated. Um, it's getting. Well, it is. I mean, I guess as you're well aware or people are, there might be a, an additional title I have, uh, but that has not been announced yet officially. So I'm not going to go knee deep in there until that's done. So um, once that happens, I'll get more involved with the schools. It's just another merit badge, Larry. I don't know. It's more of a, I think, a purple heart badge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greg. All right. Uh, thanks, Larry. Any other uh, comments for Larry or questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next on the agenda is tropical storm response. I know we talked about it at the last meeting and it was not complete, maybe by Public Works. And I know we, the mayor hit on it at, the, um, <clears throat> at our meeting yesterday. But again, hats off to all the first responders. And I, I, unless there's something I'm not sure of, I'm, from all the department heads here, I think we're back to <clears throat> normal living. There's nobody out of power. There's nobody in danger right now. But another kudos to the first responders for that. And if anybody else had any comments or questions on the response, go ahead, give it, give it up. All right. <clears throat> so the golf court, the golf cart ordinance is um, something I was brought up. <clears throat> from some concerns of people in different parts of town. And uh, we said we're going to last month just open it up and then this month have any discussions and concerns and uh, look into it on our month apart. And um, I spoke to some of the department heads and found out some things. But as a, <clears throat> as a committee here, I'd just like to hear what anybody has for opinions and concerns and uh, recommendations of, of, of that. If anybody has any. Um, I, I'm, I do. This is Laura Dancho. I just, yep. uh, I'm trying to understand the need for it. I'm open-minded about it. I hope that if it gets to the ordinance level and we do have a public hearing on it, I'd be interested to hear, you know, I, I saw a sign up on the restaurant, uh, little pub save the golf carts like they're an endangered species. So I don't know what's going on with them. So I'm just interested to find out what this is all about. I, I've talked to people that had made this proposal. Obviously uh, where there's a big population of it is over in the first district in the cottages mm -hmm. in the beach community. So um, there have been some comparison uh communities that submitted their ordinance to mr pia and i got a, i think we all got copies of that and i know that it's not it's apples and oranges and the sizes of the towns are different and and, and there's a big concern of that um i when two months ago this kind of came up and speaking from uh some of the police experience we had an angle that People are driving them. If there was something in black and white and, and an enforcement, it would 
sure up the but make it easier for the responding officer that there is an ordinance and it is either a violation or not violation. Mm -hmm. And if it's regulated, it'd be the, the theory is it'd be done safer and with more respect, especially if the fine is severe enough to discourage bad behavior or, or bad usage of it. Um, <clears throat> that was an idea two, two or three months ago. Talking to uh, Chris Pia, he has a, a bigger request from his constituents out there and we wanted just to entertain it uh mm -hmm. as a thing and well so last month well where we're at here as a public safety and and we're not i'm not going to end the discussion here i just want to put this out here our discussion here is cautiously do we think this is safe i really like the idea that uh chief mcneil said a, 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 as a a trial program to move it forward out of our committee we're either going to say cautiously let's see what it's like for a year reevaluate it with an expiration date and say that was a disaster and people are just not safe or that was uneventful i mean i i could hear the the tit for tat where people said that everybody's got these little mini bikes and the little scooters and if they can have a scooter why can't i have a golf cart and and that's that's a tit for tat we're here for the the public safety of the golf cart not who's getting away with what and and part of it also has to do with uh, to help the enforcement to to draw a very clear line on what's the right proper way with the golf cart and what's not. So with our discussion here, I'm hoping to either say by the end of the discussion with caution and even with the suggestion from the chief, let's I have no problem forwarding it to the council, which would forward it to the ordinance. Now, we're not in charge of this is where the town attorneys come in uh an hour before sunset an hour be after dusk or before dusk and all the regulations looking at what the other communities have as a guideline we can make them stricter as of right now the state of connecticut has uh recognized golf carts on roads slower than 25 miles an hour on non-state roads um a lot of restrictions and we're allowed to get even be more restrictive as a town we can't be less we could be more but that's for the town attorneys are i think what we're looking to do is say is this safe enough to give it a try for one year and reevaluate all the call volume and then that's something we work with dispatch just like anything else they, you know they use a 54 code for a motor vehicle well there could be a code just for golf carts and we could see our yeah. statistics of what the code's going to be if a golf cart is involved and then we can go back to say there was injuries uh um we certainly want to uh discourage bad behavior and as a revenue, not as a revenue, because we don't want to say it like that, but the fines really need to be defined. This is a town ordinance, it's not an infraction. If it's five, if it, if the rule is anyone under 21 is not allowed in the golf cart, it's a $500 fine. Probably no one's gonna be a repeat offender of that. If we got to tow it, we tow it. Uh, some of the suggestions of the people that want it said, let's have an annual $100 a year every summer registration fee and you get a sticker. And that's a revenue. There's rumor that there could possibly be 60 ghost golf carts floating around Lordship. So uh, <clears throat> if they were registered correctly, they pay $100 a year. If they're unregistered, it's another $500 fine. The enforcement would certainly discourage right up front bad behavior. Mm -hmm. The recreation for whatever people are, and, and I agree with you, Laura, I, 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 I'm not in the golf cart community, but I'm not taking away for the people that may be excited about it. But as a trial run and if we have every incident that's involved with the ems fire and police under a golf cart code and it's a simple dispatch change then we could go back and say you know that was a pretty reckless summer or um everybody seemed to appreciate it and they behaved and we could tweak it and 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 make it better or just dis discontinue it and i don't think we can you know the, the, it's a seasonal thing i don't Do you think, think ahead, i'm sorry Laura. Do you think you think it would be seasonal? No, I, I well, so you know, are they going to put chains on their golf cart? I'm not being facetious. Mm -hmm. I, there's people that rent cottages for the summer and they're gone. If they have a golf cart, they may be using it seasonally. There's people in Lordship. If if it's a 60 degree night in December, they may take it out. Uh, I don't know if we're going to. Well, we're not going to let them out at night, but I, I don't think it's seasonal. What I'm getting at is as as excited as they may think that we would consider this ordinance. It won't be next month where summer's over and now we're into just a different season. Uh, mm -hmm. If we 
put it forward to the council, the council would have a discussion. And then if it goes to an ordinance, that's where the lawyer, the town lawyers would have to really come out uh, and create and outline this ordinance. So I don't see this actually being in the play to maybe December, January. And I don't see a lot of golf cart activity then. But if we went from January to January, if, it, if we get the ordinance complete, we can see the call volume. We can see how often the activity of the golf carts are and monitor it. And if it's a total disaster, we'll have an expiration date on it. And that I'm not pushing for, I'm, the, I'm just representing uh, the ordinance itself and the pros and cons for it. But that's what we're discussing here as a committee. And then we'll figure out how we feel about it. And But I really thought it was uh, a clever idea to have a one year for, you know, all the time we've been on the council, I haven't heard of a, a trial ordinance, which, mm -hmm is not a bad idea and we could determine what it is or what it isn't well if are we in discussion can i yeah 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 go ahead i'm sorry so like i i could see doing a trial as well um i would see it as a seasonal thing so not necessarily january maybe like beach season maybe late march april through um october, like beginning of october when we close uh the uh, stickers at the beaches. Um, I think my only concern would be the, like I was talking to Chief McNeil, the additional police enforcement that would be required. Um, I've been down to Lordship a lot. I've already seen golf carts parked at restaurants after dark. Um, I don't know. I just think that it would be a lot of police resources to um, monitor the uh, usage of them, which would be a, con a concern of mine. I get registering them. I, I honestly wouldn't mind a trial season, but I think that it would have to be um, a beach season. Yeah, that's, yeah, maybe maybe a little extended, like March 1st to November 1st, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little longer than the, uh, the beach sticker things. And I'm not gonna speak for uh, Chief McNeil, you know, if someone makes a complaint, whether we have an ordinance or not, the cops go out for the golf cart. If they're doing proactive work and there's uh, a visible sticker that it's the the up-to-date year of registration on the um, golf cart, then it, it, the patrol car doesn't have to go out of its way to investigate what's the story with the golf cart. And um, if the fine is severe enough, I, I'm hoping that discourages the misuse of the uh, ordinance. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see if anyone else on this committee has a, a, a comment or a concern about it. The only other thing I could think of is um, the registration fee would have to be like a minimum. Um, I know, I mean, a minimum uh, criteria to do. The only other thing I can think of that would be equivalent on some other level would be the people in the Orinoke area have a separate tax because of the resources that they have up there um but in, in a trial period i don't see us going to that but that's kind of what i'm thinking and I'm, that wouldn't be fair to everybody down there but i'm thinking that if an ordinance allowing golf carts in lordship would cause more people to want them so i don't know uh chief Adel, can i speak yep go ahead um, i you know don't forget it's not just lordship uh, it's it's everywhere. So everybody will have the right to get a golf cart. And that's only fair. I'm able to get my golf cart to Lordship because I, I can't drive well, it on the roads. Right. But there's there's other community there's other places will have it. Um, it's not just going to be Lordship. And again, you just understand that if they do, then they're allowed to do it by ordinance. So it's it's just not one area. It's it's really all of Stratford, and that's just a fair thing to do. So, and that's why you probably, have, that's why you need a pretty good uh, fine structure, make sure we are able to control it as far as the, you know, not a, you know, after dusk and all the other uh, violations like. Reading lights, uh, you need four signals. Right. And, and I, honestly, I'm not even sure uh, licensing is, you know, if you're gonna do a trial period, do you really have to license that first? Just wait, see if it actually works out. There's some of the proponents that um, made the proposal to, uh, Chris P and I, they were happy to pay $100 a year annually um, to show some sort of registration. They're happy to show that it, 
may be inspected and equipped with certain sort of lighting that may be over and beyond than what a stock golf cart may come on. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we would go all that, but um, <clears throat> I and I I don't know a lot of other attractive areas that if you lived in Stratford, would you just want to just come out in your golf cart? I live in the green. I don't know if I would just you know you'd have to be on back roads. You know, mm -hmm. you know obviously Lordship has the privilege of being on the water and it, it'd be more attractive to the people there, but uh, the Beaver Dam area, maybe where, where there's a little lake over there. And I don't even know about Oranoke. They may have an ordinance within their own community there that they can or can't have a, a golf cart set. That's something they have to work in. So. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Greg Cam. Christmas list. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, to Chief's point, does it have to be a, a town wide allowance or can the golf cor carts, if they are covered by an ordinance, can they be limited to certain areas? I mean, that is that a legal thing or is there something specific that would prevent us from regionalizing the use of golf carts? I mean, I, I think that's a great question. I, I think it can be regionalized. Um, I believe that's what they did in Old Saybrook. Um, but the question is, should you and should you just be fair and, and allow it to a certain extent? I mean, that's totally up to you how to do it. But, uh, you know, if you if you regionalize it, it's a beach front or is it, you know, is it going to be north end too? I think you just got to figure it, figure it out and, and what works best. If you want to trial and use this leadership as a trial period only to see if it goes larger, that kind of makes sense, you know. And I imagine if we went through the map, you could limit what roads that can be on. I, but that, that's like I agree with the chief, though. We we're not trying to leave anybody out of this. I just think that there's some neighborhoods that would benefit from it and some that just wouldn't have any interest. There's no attraction for it. And and I. I from talking to some of these people, they're six, seven thousand dollars. They're not a uh, hundred dollar, three hundred dollar mini bike. Uh, that I, yes, I agree. Some people will purchase it more if if it becomes a successful ordinance. But I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be a household uh, product at that kind of price. Jim Duffy, just wanted to go ahead. Point a, uh, bring a couple items up. Um, I know that we've talked about the. The fact that it's going to be relatively manpower intense to look at uh, and to keep control of this. And I know the chief had said, and he made a very good point before that, uh, you know, you can't put all your resources down there. You've got to still cover the rest of the town. So one of the things we'd have to think about is we talk about enforcement of it, but enforcement can be difficult because it does take a lot of resources to do that. Another question that, or another issue that I find is if you look and research golf cart accidents throughout the country um, in places that aren't necessarily as isolated and such as like Old Saybrook and all that, um, the golf carts are not designed to withstand an impact like a car is. So when you do see car versus golf cart accidents, they tend to be significantly more severe uh, and do cause fatalities uh, in many cases. So I have a concern about that because I don't think that trying to introduce something that could bring about more injury in an accident um, is something we should take lightly without really thinking about that. Um, because we know that a lot of the roads that these are gonna be used on is gonna have commercial traffic, it's gonna have trucks, and invariably something's going to happen because nobody's perfect behind the wheel. So I just don't wanna see that happen as a result of it without us really putting some thought into it. Um, and it's gonna really change the nature of the town if this does come through. So the question I have is, is this something that we should, you know, mention to the town council as something only as an ordinance or would this down the road be something that would be more appropriate for a referendum on the ballot, let's say, because it is such a difference in the way we would be looking at the town um, and open it up basically uh, in, in a, probably it end up being next November on the ballot. I, I got to say that those are all great points. I mean, that's something we probably uh, should do to see what 
how many uh, accidents we do have in our communities and, and, and how this does affect uh, traffic safety. And that's a very good point. Yeah, I don't disagree with them. Um, I know that some of the other ordinances or some of the research that was presented to us show little to no accidents, and, but they may be in different kinds of locations. As far as main roads go, again, legally they're not allowed on a road faster than 25. That's a state rule. That's not even our rule. So we, you know, we can't even break those rules and they're not allowed on any state road. <clears throat> and obviously the fines would be severe. Um, but all those are good points to consider. Uh, and going along with, if we thought about a trial, uh, short term trial of this ordinance, I mean, those are the things we have to be concerned about. The, the, uh, 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 even though the golf cart may not be involved in the accident, like you said, it could, it could have been the cause of an accident or it could have been a cause of another problem and not be listed on the stat of our um, golf cart code number. Mm -hmm. uh, I also know that they um, are required to carry insurance in some of these communities that are equal to motor vehicles. And that's something that could be enforced if they're involved in an incident. Um, and that would, you know, for the liability of the, the, the operator and, or whoever has damaged property, at least they're, they would be enforced that they're insured. And that may be something they'd have to probably show a proof of registering it annually. They would show a proof of up to a minimal of insurance. We could look at that. That's something that the, we're looking at the safety end of that, though. That's, that's something that the lawyers would have to look at as far as enforcement and as the ordinance goes. But, um, uh, Bill. Yes. Go ahead, Greg. So the uh, it's pot, you, we could require that they have liability insurance on the golf cart or the golf yes. cart operator. Okay. Yes. Yep. Uh, uh, the some of the examples I saw from the other couple, you know, two communities, they they do require you to maintain a minimal amount of insurance, and the, I guess the quote is you know one hundred fifty two hundred dollars a year. So if we had something where you had to register your golf cart. Uh, you would have to show proof of insurance and get your annual Stratford sticker. And, you know, that could all be part of an inspection that, that see you have lights, running lights or whatever we decide to have on that for the safety end. But all, no matter how that's all rigged up, the, the, the bottom line is the safety, the hours that they operate, the roads they're allowed to operate on, uh, the speeds they could travel at, the locations they go to, and the age of the right. operators, and then if that's in violation, they're going to get a, they're going to get a coupon for it. Awesome. So, who would be the person to kind of collate those requirements so the committee could forward a recommendation to town council? I'm thinking this is new to me a little bit here and i'm not trying to kick the can we're looking at the safety issue we're 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 doing it with a lot of caution and with a lot of limitations uh i will kick the can to chris pia who who has probably the biggest audience in this and work with him and really get that structured by the town attorneys so if we left here tonight to just tell the to with a recommendation to the town council with caution and with a limitation or the things we discussed uh, to be concerned with the town attorneys and also with a expiration date of a year, then that's what we would make the recommendation to the town council. I guess it moves from the council to the ordinance and we would have to wait for Chris and I would work on, I would help Chris, but uh, we would create the ordinance with the town attorneys and try to cover all the talking points that we just tried to discuss that we had concerns about tonight. And if they're included, that presentation would be represented to the ordinance committee and then kick back to the town council for a final vote. Okay. So we don't have. Laura. I'm here. Oh, uh, right, Greg. For, for, we don't have to list individually the criteria before we send it to council. We could kind of like just say has liability insurance, has a test period of a year. You know, maybe three or four constraints, if you will. Right. And then, yeah. So if if constraints such as the examples are accommodated, 
then the public safety committee would would support an ordinance to to that effect. Right. Yes. Exactly. So right. I'm just, and I might be being redundant. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself tonight. I just wanted to discuss it and kind of say that with a cautious and with a limited timeline, with a lot of our safety concerns, I would I would recommend this to go to council to push into ordinance and then have the ordinance be written and driven and maybe once the ordinance is written with a lot of the concerns that we have then this committee reviews that again and then we could turn around and say we strongly re recommend on on this on the public safety committee we're kind of happy with the final result and then and send that back to council and however it becomes an ordinance through all jump to all the hoops for that but i just want as you know it our job is the the safety of it and if we can monitor it for a year with all the restrictions, all the enforcement and all the safety issues and, and see what the final results are after one year, then maybe we'll have it written that if, after one year upon satisfaction, then there is no expiration date and it just becomes a, a, a forever ordinance. Um, okay. So uh, that's a good discussion for tonight. We, we got the winter to sort of get the details worked out? Yes, I, I was just hoping and tonight I, to say that now we can ask the lawyers to really put in the structure of the ordinance and then that would come back to us and say, are we happy or should we add more to that? But I was hoping tonight that we were at least in agreement that I think it's a, a great idea for a one year uh, trial. I think it's it's important to keep the stats of every golf cart incident once we have that one-year trial and then look back at it again at the completion of the one year. But in the meantime, really we'll get the finished product from the lawyers and then add more, take out whatever we wanna do, and then we can make our recommendation. Secondly, again, that at least the Public Safety Committee uh, is behind that ordinance. And then if there's other committees that Chris Pia thinks should be aware of that's that's their committee's responsibilities. You know that may become a, something in zoning if they're not going to park at, at restaurants and stuff like that. But you know we'll have the safety part of it and the law enforcement part of it covered before we turn it over. Again. Very good. All right. Um, any other discussion on it? Okay, so I will make the cautious recommendation to start having uh, the lawyers look at how to construct this ordinance and they'll get back to us. That'll be my recommendation. All right, moving through uh, table items. There were none at this time. Does anybody have any new business? Um, Bill, uh I'd like to bring up a topic uh, yeah. for Chief McNeil. Uh, I believe the NAACP may have visited the police station today and may have another appointment, for example, uh, a discussion during shift changes. I'm just going to ask the chief, at least if it happened this morning, uh, how was it received? Uh, was it just your perspective? I can say this, it was, um, it was actually very powerful. It was really to, you know, we talk about it all the time. We talk about those courageous conversations where you have these open and just, you know, full conversations, no restrictions, and that's what we're having. I mean, we've always talked about it. We're actually doing it. We've always planned to do these things. It was just wasn't, we just accelerated because of current events, and we're going to continue it. Um, but we, the best part of this was actually a connection with, recruiting through uh, help of the NAACP. And, and we're just gonna continue these conversations with everybody in the community. Um, but there's some, you, well, let's be honest, there's some people that are very divisive and they don't want these community, these, uh, these uh, conversations. Um, they talk about it, but they don't really mean it. And um, you know, it's time to really put them off in the sidelines and start really working hard and working on the people that want to work together and bring us together and not put us in corners that we just shout at each other and we don't hear anything. 
And that's unfortunate, but that seems to be the way things want to be done. Um, it's our obligations as a police department and everybody else in the community to work together to figure out how we can get to these things. And this is really a case in point of it. You have to start talking. And if you start shouting, you're not going to get a, a good reception and you're just going to solidify uh, resentment. And, it, you know, that's why we're, you know, we're really reaching out. We've had this PEP program for police officers. We're going to run every single one of our officers through. We're accelerating that. So we're uh, really pushing forward. I, you know, my timeline's pushed up. I was just putting the, the finishing touches on certain programs, and I don't have any more time now. So that's where we're going, and that's what we're going to do. That's your question. Uh, there's the yeah, green. Go ahead, Greg. I'll get to you. I'll get to yeah, you thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, in an incident like this, you know, you you can it can highlight an opportunity to do better, and it can also create a divisiveness where hmm, entities become defensive or they they move into their own corner and then they start shouting. So the I. From my perspective, I, I think all of us need to, well, I believe all of us will, all of us will encourage that mutual uh, cooperation so that we are, uh, uh, I don't know, just encouraging the chief um, of all of our public safety agencies uh, and all of our town departments for that matter to just a, a adopt that and and move it forward and reassure the community periodically uh, at the penetration and meaning that more people are trained, more people are aware, uh, just demonstrate. So it, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it could be fortunate if it gets us to be more cooperative and less divisive. So it, it places a lot of onus on on the various chiefs and the town administrators, but I'm glad it seems that they're stepping up, as Chief McGill just demonstrated, and that is encouraging. And so it's an opportunity that we're, we're going to make the best of. Uh, thank so you. Also I just want to say, Greg, thank you, because one of the first people to reach out to give support was uh, was you. And that really meant a lot because um, a lot of times when something that happens, you find out who's truly believes in what you're trying to do. And I've been trying to say it for a couple of years now and to see what we've achieved and how short of a period of time to have it wiped away with a post that's false uh, on a private Facebook account is shocking to me how quickly it could crumble but well, maybe that's a lesson to me that I have to do a better job to to get my message out to people understand what we're doing here now that I know you understand so I mean we just got to keep on pushing forward D doesn't stop the personnel action that's going on which I can't talk about but at the end of the day you have to understand what we're trying to achieve here that no other police department in the state of Connecticut is doing that's how far we are. Uh, Paul Tavares, the District 3. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks for waiting. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Chief, absolutely. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself with you and Greg. And, and Chief, you know me. Uh, we've had a relationship for about three years now. So what was right can be put back and put back better. So and how we handle this situation, we handle this all together so that we can get back the public trust. So uh, I'm, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I'll speak for the committee. We're all behind each other. We all put in the hours with these department heads. We see the real work and we're proud of it. So we're gonna be supportive uh, for wherever we turn the town back into the right direction. Um, <clears throat> there's no table new business. Uh, 
Um, adjourn. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Make a motion. All right. Thank you, Paul. Second. 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 Oh, Jim, Jim Duffy. Thank you. All right. We're all done. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you. Board, uh, for that ordinance and, and with Christia very soon. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bill, Bill Perillo. Yes. I will write up something and email it to you about Thank the you. ordinance. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Have a good night, girl. Okay. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.